public like has Twitter being on like a public square. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's more good. I think like the new is it the new square? Yeah. 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 Y
that its own state procedural rule precluded post-conviction habeas relief. Was that an adequate and independent state law ground for judgment? So a state court can be reversed on the merits of its constitutional claim, but if it's applying its own procedural rule, the Supreme Court has to leave it alone. You didn't file it in time. You didn't, you know, preserve your claim by objecting at the right time, etc. But Cruz says in this case that's going to be argued this fall that it wasn't adequate, it wasn't independent. It, the rule is inadequate because it discriminates against federal law. What he says is this uh, puts defendants in a catch-22. They have to say, uh, you know, Lynch applied settled law. Arizona is saying it can't be given effect, but federal law says you have to give effect to settled law. Arizona says in response he, he could raise that at trial or on appeal, which is weird because he tried to argue <laughs> it. Um, and he could have filed a cert petition after the Arizona Supreme Court refused to apply it. By the way, there's an amicus in the case that's inviting the Supreme Court to go so far as to say you, you shouldn't be taking certiorari from state habeas proceedings at all. No. Who knows whether the court will look at that, but there are some people arguing for going that far. Um, he could have argued in a, a federal habeas petition Arizona had unreasonably applied Simmons. And so Cruz also says this rule wasn't firmly established, it wasn't regularly followed, um, and there's an argument about whether the change in precedent amounts to a significant change in the law. Cruz also says this rule, this 32.1G barrier, it's not independent of federal law. It's not just a state law ground because it's interwoven with how you figure out with the state court making a significant change in the law. And Arizona says they were only considering whether Supreme Court summary reversal was a significant change in the law. They weren't really looking at the merits. Now, uh, Professor Fisher here has filed a brief saying, you know, if you have a novel application of state procedural rule, that shouldn't be enough to bar federal review. Um, so I've, I'll let Professor Fisher talk, but let me, let me throw some questions his way after taking the presentation. <laughs> How do you think the Supreme Court should determine what's novel um, is there some concern that the court could decide who's getting out of the business? And do you see this as part of a broader trend or a one-off? Is the court you know, now tilting more in favor of defendants, or is this just an, an aberration here, a state doing something unusual, asking the Supreme Court to leave it alone? Yeah, well, thank, well thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And it's, it's always such a pleasure to be part of this conference. And panels like this with such great co-panelists, so thank you. Um, uh, as Judge Bibas says, uh, I actually have participated in, the, uh, in, in an amicus brief for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, uh, one of the hats I wear is to sometimes help them with uh, amicus briefs. So I don't get the credit for the actual authorship of the brief, but I was involved in its preparation. Um, so a couple of observations which are hopefully at least semi-responsive to the questions that have been put my way. Uh, so first is, like, why is this case on the docket to begin with? I think maybe that's what you're gesturing at with your last question. Uh, I guess my answer is to, to make the observation that it's a capital case. Uh, and two of the three cases we're going to highlight today are capital cases. And in any conversation about the Supreme Court's criminal docket, I think, um, has to take note of the fact that the, vec that the continuing presence of the death penalty in America has a skewing effect on the court's docket, for good or for ill, but for uh, the court, I think, has just continually um, felt, at least some justices have felt, the imperative to put a thumb on the scale of reviewing capital cases, particularly if they think the lower court might be wrong, in a way that they do not put a thumb on the scale of other sorts of criminal cases, even when somebody is serving life without parole. Um, and so, I think a concern for the fact that um, you have a, uh, a capital case here, who a uh, capital defendant here, who might not have received a fair hearing, that might be enough to get the case on the docket. We'll see how the court decides it. Um, in terms of like the way the court's going to approach this case, I mean, on one level, it is. Uh, I agree. I don't like the word technical, but it's a you know, uh, it, it, it's it's a it's, it's a case that is um, in the doctrinal weeds to some degree. Another way to look at the case and how I've thought about it, it's kind of a throwback case. You know, the court used to have, a few decades ago, you know, starting in the Warren Court in the Civil Rights era and into the 70s, the court had a regular um, portion of its docket where basically the issue was, are state courts acting in good faith? Are they inventing new rules? Um, 
uh, or otherwise uh, creating artificial, unjustified barriers to the resolution of federal claims and the fair treatment of federal claims. Those, those cases kind of died away right alongside the movement um, of, uh, uh, of culminating in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in 1996 of sort of presuming good faith in a very, very strong degree of state court systems and state court judges when confronted with federal claims. And so now sort of the congressionally mandated presumption, at least in some of these cases, is that state court judges are acting completely in good faith and with um, and are fully, ad fully, uh, uh, fully adequate forms to, to decide these constitutional issues. And one of the ways I think about Cruz is whether, is which of those two presumptions is going to prevail. Uh, you know, do we take the Arizona Supreme Court at its word that, you know, oh, gee, I guess we goofed up in the way we understood Simmons, but we're sorry, you know, just a, a straightforward application of our procedural rule just bars this claim on state habeas? Or is the U.S. Supreme Court, a majority of the justices, going to say to themselves, you know, the Arizona Supreme Court is just not being fair with respect to this federal claim and resisting, as they did before, they're continuing to resist the fair application of Simmons. And I think the, the impression of the justices on that kind of atmospheric question might go a long way to how they decide the particular legal issue in the case. But I'd love to hear what other people think as well, if anybody else has any thoughts. The only thing I would add is the independent adequate state ground doctrine primarily developed in terms of Supreme Court review of state court decisions. It arose in the context of the Supreme Court not being able to review a state court decision if the state court ground is completely independent of federal law and adequate to support the result. It then comes up in the habeas corpus context, often in the procedural default. Is the procedural default to be regarded as an independent state ground that would also bar the federal habeas court from hearing it? And what Jeff says is right. If you look at the 1960s, like Henry versus Mississippi, the Supreme Court was not willing to find state procedural grounds to be independent answer grounds because it really thought that they were made up. The court had a great phrase in Henry versus Mississippi saying, if the state ground is, quote, an arid ritual of meaningless form, and I do think that's a great thing, <laughs> then it doesn't have to be treated as an independent and state ground. And so it's interesting in terms of the procedural posture of this, and also how relatively few cases there have been about the independent and state ground doctrine in either context in recent years. Let's move on uh, to the next case, which is uh, Jones versus Hendricks, and I'm going to let uh, Dean Chemerinsky, do the brief on that one. Jones versus Hendricks is going to be argued on November 1st also. Let me give a hypothetical to explain what this is about. And then there's a dispute as to whether or not the facts of Jones versus Hendricks fit into the hypothetical. Imagine somebody is convicted in federal district court of a federal crime. The person is sentenced. The person uses all of the direct appeals. The person files a 2255, which is how habeas is done for federal prisoners, it's denied. Many years later, the Supreme Court hands down a decision concerning the statute that the person was convicted under. And it would seem under the Supreme Court's decision that the person couldn't be convicted <coughs> today. The person then wants to file another 2255. But one of the key changes that the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty brought about was to limit the ability to bring second, third, or successive petitions. And this is embodied with regard to 2255s and 225H. It says that in order for somebody to file a successive petition, they need a permission from a federal court of appeals. And the grounds are very narrow. One ground would be that there's new facts that couldn't have been discovered through due diligence that would show that the person was much more likely than not, by clear and convincing evidence, innocent of the crime. And that's not what's relevant in this case. The other part of 2025H says, if there's a Supreme Court decision on a constitutional ground that the Supreme Court says applies retroactively, then the person can have a successive petition. But that doesn't apply in the circumstance that I've just described, because what I've described is the Supreme Court changing the interpretation of the federal statute. It's not a constitutional ground, so 2025H doesn't apply. But there's a safety valve in 2255, 2255E, that says if the procedures in 2255 
are inadequate or ineffective to deal with the problem of an unlawful detention, then a person can bring a habeas petition under the general statute 2241. In the circumstance that I just described, can somebody bring a habeas petition under 2241, or is it precluded by the language that I described, 2255H, that says you don't get successive petitions except in the circumstances provided in the statute? So that's the basic issue. Now I can talk about Jones versus Hendricks and whether it fits into that. Um, Marcus Jones was convicted in the year 2000. He was convicted of two counts of being a felon and unlawful possession of firearm, and one of lying in order to be able to get a permit for a gun. Um, his total sentence was, it was uh, 30, 27 years in prison. Um, he was given a sentence on each count, and they were to run consecutively, but it's 27 years in prison. He's in prison a long time. He did his direct appeals, he filed his 2255, all of that's done. Then in 2019, the Supreme Court decides Rahaf versus the United States. And the court says, when it comes to the felon in possession statute, it has to be shown both that the person knew that he or she was a felon not allowed to have guns, and also have to show that he or she knew that he had or she had illegal guns. And now, Marcus Jones comes back, wants to file a successive petition, and he wants to do so using 2255E's escape mechanism, filing a habeas petition under 2241, and he says, I didn't know that I was not allowed to have guns because I thought my convictions had been expunged. Since I thought my convictions had been expunged, I didn't know this applied to me. So under Rahaf, I should be able to get relief. The United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit rules against him, and the Eighth Circuit says, if we let you use 2241 under this circumstance, it would negate 2255H, which says you only get to file a successive petition if you've got factual innocence, or it's a Supreme Court's constitutional decision that the Supreme Court says applies retroactively. And the Eighth Circuit says, no, you can't file a successive petition under these circumstances. That directly conflicts with other circuits, like the Tenth Circuit, which I think explains why the Supreme Court granted a review in this case. Now, Jones' argument to the Supreme Court is, look at 2255E. If you accept the Eighth Circuit's interpretation, it's rendered superfluous. It's deprived of meaning. It makes sense that you'd find in this circumstance that the procedures, the, the procedures that are available under 25 are inadequate or ineffective to deal with detention, the very language of 2255E. Also, there's a constitutional argument raised. Um, a good deal of the brief that Jones has filed in the Supreme Court says, to interpret this any other way would raise serious constitutional questions. And he identifies a number of constitutional questions. Would this be an impermissible suspension of the writ of habeas corpus if there's no way to file a successive petition? Would this violate separation of powers so it would, in essence, negate 2255E. Would this be a denial of due process? Would this be cruel and unusual punishment under the circumstances? Interestingly, the Solicitor General's office said it would defend the result in this case, but not the reasoning of the Eighth Circuit. The Solicitor General's office says, if a person can show that he or she is actually innocent, then there should be the relief available under 2255E. The Solicitor General's office agrees with Jones that if you accept the Eighth Circuit's approach, that nullifies 2255E. But the Solicitor General's office says, you've got to have actual innocence, that no reasonable juror would convict. And the Solicitor General's office says, Jones had 12 prior felony convictions before these felony convictions. He surely knew there were valid felony convictions against him, and he knew that he wasn't allowed to have guns, and so even though the SG's office would agree with a lot of the reasoning in Jones' brief, they say, Jones, you shouldn't get this relief because you can't show the actual innocence that would be required in order to take advantage of the safety valve of 2241. 
The Supreme Court appointed an amicus, Morgan Ratner, who argued last night, and the amicus very much defends the reasoning of the Eighth Circuit and says that, as the Eighth Circuit did, you don't get a successive petition unless you can show factual actual innocence or it's the Supreme Court decision interpreting the Constitution that the Supreme Court says applies retroactively. So it's interesting, something we were talking about, that there is an underlying issue about what do we mean by actual innocence. It's also interesting here that the Solicitor General's office is trying to take a middle position, preserving some room for 2255E, but not in this case. So Jeff, this is another one where <laughs> you had your hand in the amicus brief, so give us your thoughts on, on Jones. Thanks. I, I think Jones is a fascinating case, actually. Uh, let me say a couple things about methodology as they might play out in this case, because I think one of the interesting things about the criminal docket, um, and this picks up on Judge Bibas's point, perhaps, without the, particularly without the big, splashy, ideologically uh, divisive cases, where I think the court in some ways is more committed to methodology uh, or more attentive to methodology in the criminal cases in ways that they can often agree across ideological lines. So let me say one thing about text and another thing about history and tradition. Uh, two things you've heard a lot about in this conference already, probably. Uh, so I think the textual arguments are really interesting in this case. Um, as, as Irwin says, the key language is whether or not um, uh, a 2255 motion under the circumstances he describes would be, uh, you know, the, the text says, is, is inadequate or ineffective uh, to test the legality of the detention. And what the Eighth Circuit said, um, and what the amicus uh, Morgan Ratner's brief says is, uh, no, it's not inadequate or ineffective because uh, Jones could have brought a 2255 after his conviction and argued that um, and argued that uh, there was a mens rea component to the statute that wasn't satisfied in his case. And the Eighth Circuit says, yeah, you would have lost that because our precedent on the books at the time was you didn't need to have that mens rea, but it doesn't mean it was ineffective or in, 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 inadequate or ineffective. Um, but notice what I just did, and I actually... This is what the Eighth Circuit said. They said it was <coughs> adequate. Um, but the statute says is. Uh, is adequate or effect, is inadequate or ineffective. And so what we argue in our amicus brief um, is that uh, even two-letter words uh, can have a lot of uh, meaning in the plain language world. And is inadequate or ineffective requires you to ask right now would a 2255 motion be able to be brought? And for the reasons Irwin says, the answer to that is no, because the statute as amended would preclude it because it's not factual innocence and it's not constitutional. And so then the question arises, well, wait a minute, haven't you just defeated those, those, uh, those requirements Congress uh, established? And then I, this is where I think the other part of the language of the statute is critical, uh, where it says inadequate or ineffective to test the legality of the detention. And so then the question means, what is the legality of a detention? Um, and what we say in our brief is that's actually a very narrow class of habeas claims. It's not simply arguing, as habeas petitioners usually do, that, that the rules followed at my trial were unfair. Uh, so to say I was convicted in violation of constitutional requirements about the way my trial is conducted is not to challenge the legality of your detention. Instead, what, the, what it means to challenge the legality of your detention is to say, I'm in prison for something that isn't a crime. Like, it is illegal to hold me because I did not commit a crime, or at least it's illegal to hold me for this length of time because the statute prohibits punishment above uh, some lower length. And so if you think about that phrase as restricting the claims to that, then I think you kind of find a way that the text works in a way that it doesn't, at least this is what our argument is, that doesn't defeat uh, the amendments Congress enacted in 1996. And that's where I get my second point about history and tradition, and I'm very, very interested to see whether it plays a role in the way the court thinks about this case. Um, the, br the briefs in the case, um, both our brief to some degree and Mr. Jones's brief to a greater degree, highlight that for decades uh, before even the uh, original 2255 statute was passed, the federal courts granted habeas relief in exactly this situation, and in fact reserved it for this situation. When somebody was in prison for something that was deemed not to be criminal, or was deemed to be serving a sentence in excess of what the statute allowed. And that was the core reason for habeas traditionally. Now, in the mid-20th century, we expanded habeas on the federal and state side to talk about the other kind of procedural errors I described. But the traditional core of habeas is this, I'm in prison for something that isn't a crime. And whether that has any play for the court 
uh, by way of um, interpreting this phrase in the statute, I think will be something really interesting to watch. Aren't, aren't the boundaries there, though, kind of muddy? Isn't the reason we had this procedural expansion because of, precisely because of the risk that absent compliance with constitutional guarantees, you might actually be in prison for a crime you didn't commit because the jury was incapable of discerning as much? I think you can make, I, I think you could say that, that the ultimate reason why we require these procedural rules to be followed is to avoid that risk. But that to me is, diff, that's a second, that's an indirect claim rather than a direct claim that says that the statute under which I am imprisoned uh, does not render my conduct a crime. Right. So the key, the key point is that Rahaf adds this mens rea requirement, which Jones says was not met in his case. So he's literally sitting in jail for something the Supreme Court has said is not a crime. Right. So in other words, my conviction is substantively invalid as opposed right. to procedurally invalid. Right, right. And reading the briefs and talking about text, history, and tradition, it was fascinating. Uh, if I'm remembering this right, there's a site, site to an English common law case from 1691, if I'm not <laughs> wrong about that. Um, and so they're going way back with looking at sort of how this was done. And obviously, if you look at the opinions from the previous term, Dobbs and Bruin and the court being very focused on the textualist and originalist approach, you see some of the advocates in these cases using some of that and going way back and looking at how habeas was used uh, previously. Um, so let's move on to Reed versus Gertz. And so we're, again, we have, we have three law professors here, so I put them to work. So Jeff's going to do the brief on, on Reed versus Gertz. Okay, I'll try to be brief in that because I've talked a fair amount already and leave, leave, leave the real interesting stuff to Megan. Uh, so this case arises technically not in a criminal prosecution but in a section 1983 lawsuit uh, where, uh, where Mr. Reed who was convicted of murder and sentenced to death in Texas state court is actually bringing in a civil rights lawsuit challenging the Texas rules that govern his access to uh, evidence for DNA testing he says, to prove his innocence uh, of the crime. Uh, so he was convicted uh, of a murder, as I said, of, um, of a woman uh, many, many uh, years ago. Um, uh, when the police conducted the investigation, they found a belt, uh, her own belt, near her. Uh, and it seems that the belt was used to strangle her to death. Uh, he says, all these years later, I did not commit this crime. And I want to have DNA testing on that belt because I think it will show that actually his, her fiancé uh, is the one who killed her because uh, he found out about the affair she was having with me and was upset about it, and that's, uh, that's who I think committed this crime. So I'm asking uh, the Texas DA to conduct DNA testing to find out you know, whose DNA may be on this belt. Uh, the DA has refused uh, uh, to, conduct, to conduct that testing. Uh, and so under some Supreme Court decisions decided in the past decade as we've had the innocence and DNA movement, um, there is the right of a cause of action under uh, Section 1983 to bring a lawsuit in federal court arguing that the state court procedures for DNA testing violate the due process clause because they are fundamentally unfair in blocking uh, any reasonable attempt to prove one's innocence for, uh, for a crime for which the person has been convicted. Yeah. And the particular argument that Mr. Reed makes in that respect is uh, that the Texas courts held that um, uh, he could not uh, have access to the belt for DNA testing because he could not satisfy a chain of custody and anti-contamination requirement in the state statutes um, uh, that, you know, in, in essence are designed, the state court said, to ensure that uh, the DNA that one might find on a piece of evidence would be uh, you know, would be accurate uh, and not contaminated or something. His argument is, well, that's ridiculous. The state has had custody of this the entire time, and so if there's a problem with the with the with the with the, with, with the evidence, it's the state's fault, and that can't possibly be put on to me. Uh, but that's not the issue in front of the court. Um, the, the, in other words, the uh, the adequacy of Texas procedure is not in front of the court. Instead, what's in front of the court is issue of timeliness and the statute of limitations. The question is, uh, did Mr. Reed bring his claim too late? Uh, there are three possibilities discussed in the papers of when, uh, when, a, um, when a cause of action uh, for inadequate DNA testing procedures might accrue. The first is when a state trial court uh, denies your request under state law to have access to the evidence for DNA testing because at that moment you're at least on initial notice that state law is barring your access to the evidence for testing. 
The second place we might draw the line and say the claim accrues is when the state high court uh, decides that issue on appeal. And then the third place might be if you ask for rehearing in the state high court uh, when that state, when that rehearing petition is denied. And so what the state argues is, in this case, is that, and what the uh, Fifth Circuit held, is that um, it's the first thing. It's when the trial court decides uh, the issue. At that moment, uh, state law has been construed adversely to you, and you are injured and ought to be on notice that you have a claim that you need to bring. Um, the state says, well, at the very least, it's when the state high court decides that issue, because that's when it's final in our state court system, at, uh, at least in terms of a substantive ruling. Um, uh, and if either of those things are true, uh, Mr. Reed is out of court. Uh, if, however, uh, his petition for rehearing in the Texas High Court told the issue further, and only when that rehearing was denied did his claim accrue, then his claim would be timely. Uh, and that's what he argues is the right thing. And I'll, I think maybe at that point with the issue set up, uh, I'll hand it off to, to Megan to talk about what the arguments are and how she thinks it might go. So this is unique. So Megan has done an amicus brief in this case on behalf of a set of legal scholars, one of whom is, is Dean Timorinsky. <laughs> <laughs> we have your client here as well. So let's right. first and then we'll hear from your client. That's right. Um, I think, you know, I want to stress at the outset one thing Jeff said in passing, which is, um, you know, the real issue in the case, or the real sort of issue between uh, Mr. Reed and, a, and proof of his innocence is whether uh, you know, if he's innocent, is whether, um, you know, Texas's rule precluding him from accessing DNA evidence on the ground that he didn't control the chain of custody violates due process protections. And that's, you know, ultimately the fairness question that occupies us and, you know, and, and about which we, we might want um, definitiveness in thinking about um, the ultimate fairness of his conviction. But that's not the issue before the court, and that issue might never be reached, um, at least in this proceeding, because of the intermediate technical, uh, uh, to use a pejorative term, um, question of whether his claim is timely at all. Um, and there's also, you know, the question, you know, why um, the court granted this case, and to Jeff's earlier observation, I think part of it is uh, that it is a capital case with uh, actual innocence dimensions. There's, you know, record evidence here that the murder victim's fiance had um, said some pretty incriminating things about his own responsibility for the crime. And so there's reason to believe that with the development of further evidence um, that, uh, you know, Mr. Reed might be able to establish his innocence. Um, but the other sort of Cross current here um, is that the you know the Fifth Circuit decision is in some tension with a variety of other um, principles and doctrines that typically call for state processes to run their course before a federal court jumps in. Um, so, for example, um, in the habeas context, there are well developed principles of exhaustion and exclusivity. Um, that require a, uh, a litigant to um, pursue relief in state court um, before they seek recourse um, in the federal courts. There are other um, uh, related principles um, that preclude litigants from challenging the validity of um, a state court criminal conviction through collateral federal proceedings. Um, and then there are, uh, you know, a variety of abstention doctrines, younger abstention chief among them, that say um, federal courts um, should not be in the business of conducting parallel proceedings um, while criminal proceedings are running their course in state court. So you have, you know, a, a, a plethora of doctrines and principles saying to federal courts, wait for the state courts to speak. Um, and then you have this decision from the Fifth Circuit saying, no, you should race to the courthouse um, as soon as you get an adverse decision from an inferior um, state court. Um, and the court, uh, the Supreme Court, um, grappled with a you know, somewhat similar issue um, a few terms ago in a case called 
um, McDonough, uh, where they had to decide um, whether, in a, you know, sort of a, a similar context. Um, whether 19, when the you know time for um, filing a 1983 claim should commence, and they considered the options. Uh, you know, one option was when the trial court ruled, and another was when the appellate court ruled. And they recognized that you know we could, we have to come up with a rule here, and we could make the rule be that you just file as soon as you get notice of an adverse decision in the trial court. But why do that? Um, when, as soon as you go to federal court, the first thing the federal court is going to do is stay its hand and wait for the state proceedings um, to run their course. We don't need nor do we want um, a system of, you know, ad hoc decision making by district courts um, uh, that will, you know, reach the same result to wait um, when we could just have a rule saying the, the same thing. So you had that result in McDonough and you've got, I think, strong pressures um, to, you know, achieve a similar result here. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, it's hard to read tea leaves and I think the state offers some arguments, you know, why the court doesn't really need to reach um, the ultimate question at all. But, you know, this is one of those cases where they just need a rule. One is sort of a discovery rule that would require some factual investigation into um, when the litigant learned of his or her claim. Um, and another is a pretty bright line rule that's easy to administer and that makes, you know, court's jobs easier um, because all they have to do is see when that last, you know, decision was rendered by an appellate court. And that's, you know, easier um, for them to administer. Um, they, you know, they may not reach those questions because um, Texas says there are other uh, problems, a, a, a litany of other problems that get in the way, which I think betrays on Texas's part some insecurity about the merits of their substantive arguments. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, this is a case where you need, uh, you just need to provide some direction to courts and litigants about um, what to do. And at the end of this case, we will know what to do. <laughs> so I want to give the dean a chance, since uh, you're one of the folks that Megan is representing in that in that amicus brief. <laughs> I think she did a terrific job of presenting the argument and what's at issue in the case. Um, but I, I, the only thing I would highlight is I think the intersection of the federal jurisdiction issues and the 1983 suit becomes so important because it's easy to imagine a catch-22 where there's never a time that you can bring it. If you bring it while it's pending, no, you're barred by younger abstention. You bring it when it's done, you're barred because it's too late. And the question is, what is the point at which somebody can bring a claim like this? That's exactly right, particularly if the federal court were to dismiss the action on abstention grounds, right? If they stay, it's less of a risk. But if they kick you out of court altogether, then you get into weird preclusion questions. Well, you know, as I'll also observe, since it's a Supreme Court conference, that one of the other places the court may look for an analogy is its own rules. Yeah. Uh, and the timing rules for filing a petition in the U.S. Supreme Court run from the denial of rehearing in the right. state Supreme Court. Mm -hmm not from the date of decision in the state Supreme Court. And I wonder whether just that familiarity well, will be... That you're exactly right. In Texas, in its brief, argues um, you should look no further than the rules of your court, uh, of this court, um, Justices, because you will GBR case without waiting for a decision on rehearing, um, which makes no sense, right? A GBR is um, a procedural mechanism, a grant vacate remand is something that happens when a petition is already pending, when the litigant has already decided to file the petition in the Supreme Court, irrespective of whether there's a rehearing decision pending. So it's actually incoherent, <laughs> um, but that's what they argue. So let's move on to our final topic. I wanted to ask the panel, we got a few minutes here. I know um, Irwin and, and the judge maybe have to leave a little bit early, but I wanted to talk about Justice Jackson and in particular about her background. Uh, so she was in the Federal Public Defender's Office for a stint and also was on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. So I was just intrigued to hear the panel's thoughts on what having someone like her on the Supreme Court might mean for the docket, for the development of the criminal law, constitutional criminal procedure, substantive criminal law, all those types of issues. So. I, I'll start. I want to I call on the judge first. Sure. So I. Uh, when I, many people who've made it up to the court have come from having very kind of 
rarefied appellate backgrounds. Um, now, it's, it's important to note that, you know, a century, half a century ago even, there were many more varied ways up to the Supreme Court. Byron White had never been a judge. He'd been an NFL pro player. Uh, Thurgood Marshall obviously had done a ton of litigation in the trial courts. These days, um, you know, everyone but Justice Kagan had been an appellate judge. And, you know, many of them have never tried a case. John Roberts, you know, famously the best appellate lawyer of his generation. Um, and so you do have Justice Alito and Justice Sotomayor, who were both prosecutors, uh, and Justice Sotomayor was also a trial judge, but you don't have very much trial experience. And so Justice Jackson, since her primary judicial experience was as a trial judge, you know, that may be a more fact-specific lens to look at things through. And having been on the Sentencing Commission likewise, I think, you know, it, it could lead to, you know, granting cert in more cases. I mean, who, who knows how this plays out with the rest of them, but it's, it's a useful thing to have some range of perspectives. We don't have, as I said, the way it was three quarters of a century ago where people have been in, you know, FDR's administration and coming from lots of other places. It's still, you know, a more elite group, disproportionately people who clerked at the Supreme Court, you know, including Justice Jackson, but still, her background as a public defender and on the Sentencing Commission, a trial judge, may mean kind of more attention to some of these in-the-weeds criminal issues. Now, whether there's appetite among other justices to go along is anybody's guess. Sort of springing off, off well, go ahead. No, please. Uh, you know, I think um, there's a, I think observers of the court, I think, have seen in recent years a tendency, maybe not even recent years, <laughs> since time immemorial, a tendency um, among the justices sometimes to be freewheeling about the facts developed um, below and the facts that are in the record or that may not be in the record. And I wonder whether Justice Jackson's experience as um, a trial litigator and a trial court judge might um, enable her to bring some discipline to that process or to remind them that there, it really does matter um, that there is evidence, you know, before a court. There, there are factual issues that are decided by juries. Um, there are things that are the proper subject of expert testimony and that should not be, you know, considered by the court outside the parameters of Rule 702. Um, and whether she might be able to just remind the justice, justices um, of those considerations in some of their um, conversations about their cases. Last night, several of us were talking and remarked that we were surprised that at the panel, there had been really no discussion of the fact there was a new justice on the court. And usually, whenever there's a new justice, it's a focus for a good deal of discussion at the preview. And I think we all had the sense that's because it wasn't that likely that, at least in the short term, Justice Jackson was going to change the overall ideological composition of the court. But I do think as we think about how she's changed the court, a couple of things that I would say. One is she brings unique experiences. She's the first black woman to ever serve on the court. And we know from Justice served with Thurgood Marshall that his describing his experiences had an effect on them. We know from other justices what they said that Justice O'Connor being the first woman on the court brought experiences that affected them. And of course, as we're talking about here, Justice Jackson was a public defender. And whatever experience we have, obviously affects our perspective. That one has to. And the other thing that I'd say that's related to that is that this may be an area where replacing Justice Breyer with Justice Jackson can make a difference in some cases. We tend to forget that one of the areas, especially in the last decade, where Justice Breyer is more likely to be the conservatives was Fourth Amendment cases. Maryland versus King about whether police can take DNA from a suspect to see if it matches DNA from an unsolved crime in the database. It was five to four with Justice Breyer joining the conservatives. Justice Scalia wrote a strong dissent, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Navarrete versus California. Can police, on the basis of an anonymous tip of erratic driving, stop a car without the police observing erratic driving themselves? Five to four in favor of the police, Justice Breyer joining the conservatives, just Thomas writing, Justice Scalia writing the dissent, joined with Justice Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Utah versus Streiff in 2016, if police 
illegally stop somebody, but discover there's an outstanding warrant, can they arrest and do a search incident to arrest? Five to three, it was the year Justice Scalia died, with Justice Breyer joining the majority and Justices Ginsburg, Sutter, and Kagan dissenting. Obviously, we can't presume how Justice Jackson would have voted in those cases, but it may very well be that Fourth Amendment, maybe some other criminal procedure areas, are a place where she will vote differently than Justice Breyer would. And of course, all of this is in the short term. She's 51 years old. She can be on the court for decades. It can make an enormous difference in the long term. Maybe I'll pick up with that and other areas of criminal procedure, <laughs> um, and but uh, name a couple more, um, somewhat near and dear to my heart. Uh, Justice Breyer was on the dissenting side of uh, many of the court's recent confrontation decisions, um, of siding with the prosecution in those cases, and also in the Apprendi line of cases, uh, involving whether sentencing facts go to juries. Uh, Justice Breyer was one of the most uh, resistant to the expansion of that doctrine. And so, again, I don't know what Justice Jackson will think of those two things, but there's a possibility for possible um, uh, movement there. Um, I just want to amplify, I think the others have said um, much of what I would have said, and I think it's interesting that we all ended up talking about her experience as a trial judge uh, as maybe being as important uh, as some of the other features for background, which have been discussed more uh, in the public and the press. Uh, but let me amplify two things, and one is about, um, if you think about it from the standpoint of a Supreme Court litigator and Supreme Court decision making, uh, one is incentives and another is administrability. Uh, so the Supreme Court, when it decides criminal cases like any others, but I can just think of numerous times in the criminal sphere, the court will ask during oral argument, well, you know, if we establish this rule, then won't criminal defendants do X, Y, Z, and won't, won't, that, won't criminal defense lawyers have the incentive to gain the system in this way or make these kind of objections that way or pull a string? And to finally have a former criminal defense lawyer in the room and on the bench to participate in those conversations and not simply two former prosecutors and seven other justices who uh, didn't practice criminal law, I think may shift that conversation in interesting ways, uh, both on the bench and maybe in the conference room as well. Um, and then administrability is another kind of bread and butter consideration for the U.S. Supreme Court when they make decisions and announce rules. And Megan was just talking about the rule for limitations periods. You know, just we need to know what it is and how's it going to work. And there are any number of times in oral argument where the court will say, well, if we announce this rule, is it going to be workable? Are district judges going to be able to operate under it? Or, are they, or the Supreme Court, a justice might float a rule, and a lawyer might try to say, geez, I'm not sure that's going to really work in the field. In practice, we need to know with more specificity what the rules are. Well, Justice Jackson, having sort of been a trial judge, um, can do what Justice Sotomayor has done a little bit, but I think maybe even more, which is speak from the standpoint of a trial judge on the bench. I mean, I've talked, I don't know, Judge Bevis, if you've had this experience, but I've talked with other Court of Appeals judges who say sometimes when they have a former district judge or a current district judge sit with them by designation or has just been elevated to the appeals court, that can bring a really important perspective into the conference room. And so I think the same thing would be true of the U.S. Supreme Court. It's, it's, it's unexpected. So when I was at baby judge school and we had our dinner <laughs> at the Supreme Court, I was talking with Justice Sotomayor and I asked, how did being a former trial judge affect her? And she said, you know, I will almost never find something to have been plain error. I've been there. It's confusing. You know, you're trying to read the record. How can you expect sandbag this trial judge who wasn't warned about this? There was no objection to alert him to pick it, pick it at the right time. So I think that's pretty valuable to understand that, yes, um, you don't always know. And the trial judge may have a very different perspective on that. Yeah, I know. Uh, he's got a plane to catch, I think. Um, so we got some time here. We got a few minutes to take some questions from, from folks. I don't know if anyone has a question. This young man. Uh, just when, when you both write briefs for, you know, on either side of um, an issue before the court, I was wondering with these more technical cases, are you drafting these briefs directed at one particular justice or at a group of justices who you may think are more favorable to your position, maybe in not such an ideological spectrum, but perhaps just in, in this one area of the law? Yeah, I mean, sort of, yes. Um, I think, I, I think sort of the, um, 
there is sort of a finite boundary around the modes of argument that are now available to you um, to reach a majority of justices on the court. And then I think within that sort of general area, in a given case, you may be considerate of the kinds of arguments that are likely to resonate with um, the justices who may be available to you. But often, I mean, in a, you know, a case like, like Reed, like I just discussed, um, or, uh, you know, some other statutory interpretation cases, it, it, there may not be that much um, variability um, in the arguments that you would present. You're trying to offer, you know, the best textual argument you have rooted in tradition that makes sense in the context of other doctrines that are well established. And that is a pretty universal mode of legal argument. Yeah, I think well, William Brennan once said the most important rule in the Supreme Court is how to count to five. Uh, and so I think that if you pick up a case representing a party in the Supreme Court, one of the very first things you better think about is how do I get to five or beyond? And so methodology can often have a lot to do with that, um, particularly if you have an argument that you know, maybe you're thinking a majority of the court isn't going to like so much on policy grounds, so how am I going to get them to think other kinds of methodological methodological commitments they have are going to drive them there. You definitely think about who your court is or who you want it to be. I mean, hopefully it's more than five, but at least getting to five. Um, you know, if you're writing an amicus brief, sometimes you can drill down on even a portion, you know, a particular justice or a particular wing of the court. But if you're a party, though, um, I think you can't just do that. You have to, you have to lay out every possible good argument. And so, you know, I've sometimes joked in my clinic with my students that the table of contents in our briefs should sometimes say, you know, Justice Thomas, turn to page 22. Uh, <laughs> Justice Breyer, you're going to want to turn, turn to page 38. This is where your argument is. Uh, you know, different kinds of approaches. And you just argue them all in the alternative, trying to weave it into a coherent overall theme and narrative. Well, related to that, I, it remains to be seen whom Justice uh, Jackson will be like. You know, I think Justices... Kagan and Sotomayor have different approaches. Justice Sotomayor is much more inclined to write a solo dissent, um, you know, much more inclined to be more fiery in a case like Utah versus Streif. And Justice Kagan might be a more, you know, compromise or split the baby or, you know, how can we come together on some kind of middle ground position? And that will affect what kinds of coalitions uh, wind up emerging in some of these decisions. <laughs> Professor Larson, um, I was just wondering, you mentioned this, Jeff, about the docket. So now there's only three, three liberal judges who could possibly take an error correction case, which sometimes happens in the criminal case. Yeah. Do you see someone in the six who might join them on the cert? Or like, what, do, what do you think, how will that affect the docket going forward? Uh, well, thanks for asking the question. I think it's a fascinating question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, and maybe the, maybe the answer is going to be issue specific. Uh, so it might be that uh, that particular uh, rules of criminal procedure like Miranda and the Fourth Amendment's exclusionary rule that are more disfavored by the conservative majority uh, are going to be very unlikely to generate grants uh, no matter how uh, questionable the lower court decision might be. I think you might just have hesitation on um, on, on, on the liberal wing, uh, or even if they're there, you won't have a fourth vote to get the case in the door. Uh, maybe there'll still be some other cases and uh, other kinds of claims. I just mentioned confrontation and Apprendi, uh, maybe Brady. Uh, I have, you know, I have a, a, a Brady petition of my own pending right now, so I'm hoping that might fall on a different side of the ledger. So maybe, um, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm really wondering. I don't know what the answer is going to be because um, how the court ultimately decides a case um, does not necessarily key back to who voted to take the case in the first place. And so you'll often have a case that gets in the door, and once it gets in the door, uh, like a case like Flowers against Mississippi a couple of years ago involving a Batson violation, um, uh, which is uh, race discrimination in the selection of jury, uh, which was decided uh, by a lopsided vote, but uh, it may well have only been four justices who forced the case on the docket in the first place. And, you know, those are important decisions, not just for the not just for the um, parties involved, of course, uh, but I think that I, 
again, I'm sitting next to a judge here, so uh, I'll be careful. But I think just reminding judges of the importance of certain doctrines and sending messages and maybe even marginally shifting the doctrine, even in an error correction case, I think can have a big effect on uh, day-to-day trial court procedure and, and maybe even appellate uh, decision making. It's sort of a, uh, what I think is almost a related question about um, 1983 qualified immunity, and I know that's not really a criminal thing, but it comes up yeah. so often in the criminal context. I mean, I feel like there was um, a move afoot for a while to get the court to reconsider that, you know, look at text, look at history and tradition, where does this come from? Is that still ongoing? Do you see any prospects for that? Where do you think this court seems to be on qualified immunity? Mm. Yeah, as you say, there was a, a moment uh, where, uh, where Justices Thomas and Sotomayor most vocally uh, wrote separately to question whether the court's qualified immunity jurisprudence uh, had a basis in law, uh, to put it bluntly. Uh, and so you thought to yourself, boy, if you've got Justice Thomas and Justice Sotomayor wanting to relook at this, seems like the court, you know, that's a pretty good proxy for having, uh, for having majority of the court interested in this issue. Uh, but whether because of additional shifts in membership or other dynamics, it seems to be the revolution that wasn't. Uh, the court has pulled back. Uh, I, I had one of uh, several petitions up asking the court not just to hold I, it, There were several petitions that went up asking the court to just revisit qualified immunity in toto and to just abolish it. Uh, I filed a petition last year, and there were a couple others filed to say, okay, maybe you don't want to do that. But here's sort of some lingering questions on the boundaries of qualified immunity, how it applies and when it applies. Maybe you want to take that as at least a starter course. Uh, and the court denied all those cases, too. Um, I don't know what the theory is on that, whether the, whether the court thought about it internally and there's almost like a substantive uh, set of decisions that have been made that they don't want to shift the law. Another dynamic that was interesting while those petitions were going up was Congress was also considering potential legislation in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Uh, maybe the court said to itself they'd rather have this done legislatively or at least give Congress a chance to do this first. And so if, it's, if it appears that that legislation is not going to bear any fruit, whether the court might revisit these, uh, the notion of uh, taking up qualified immunity. Um, you know, we could hope for that, but um, but maybe it's going to have to be legislative. The, the one thing I would add is I've still I've seen in the intermediate courts of appeals, and you may have seen this too, some ongoing amicus activity by conservative legal organizations asking the courts to reconsider um, qualified immunity principles. So it may be that after some development in the courts of appeals, it could um, mm -hmm. come back at the invitation of those associations again. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, Justices uh, Gorsuch and Thomas have recently raised questions about habeas, uh, the availability of habeas from state uh, court proceedings, and, yeah. um, and looked at the history and said basically that from the founding through much of the early part of the 20th century, habeas was only really available for state prisoners if the, the state court lacked like, jurisdiction at, at all. Uh, right. do, uh, do you have any sense of sort of where that argument might potentially be going? Well, we don't. I mean, there might be two or three votes for that. We haven't had any signs that we're at five or close to five. Um, you know, it's, it's, it may not go back to the founding. It goes back to the mid-20th yeah. century, and there are a number of justices who are, you know, less willing to, to kind of throw that out. I mean, it, it might correlate with your view of precedent. Obviously, Justices Gorsuch and Thomas have a, you know, different understanding of precedent from maybe a, a, a Chief Justice Roberts. I'll just say I'd be surprised. I think it's interesting that those two justices have put that stake in the ground. I'd be surprised to see a majority to do it because in my view, it's not just a question of stare decisis, which Brown against Allen mm -hmm. did hold in the mid-20th century that habeas, uh, jurisdiction, habeas relief extends beyond, quote, jurisdictional defects. But I'll say it's hard for me to understand how Congress has not ratified the Brown decision in its... In, in EDPA itself, mm -hmm. it's all based on the premise that you can bring these kinds of claims. And so, uh, so you know, if the issue were ever robustly briefed in front of the court, I might make that kind of an argument as well, uh, that Congress has sort of blessed that system, even if it didn't create it in the first place. Um, but I think it is interesting to see, 
those two justices saying, look, if we don't think the Brown v. Allen test is satisfied, we're going to be very, <laughs> very uh, unlikely to grant, to vote to grant relief in any of these cases. I guess the other thing I'll add real quickly is Jones against Hadix might give another opportunity for the court to talk about that historical understanding of habeas because jurisdictional defects were expanded by the Supreme Court to, un to include not just as we think of today, um, uh, subject matter part jurisdiction, but uh, but holding somebody for something that wasn't a crime was thought of as a jurisdictional defect as well. We'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much. Is a state conviction. What about making state state habeas? I mean, I was wondering if he was just making the Mitchell Mortara argument. Oh, 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 oh. No. I think you're right. She's like, this is irrelevant, but I guess I have to spend pages on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so no pressure. I do. I mean, I do. I've lost track of the topic. That question. I think it's bipartisan. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah, it was. It went well. Fascinating. Oh, good. Will we see you at the reunion this October? Uh, I'll probably be around. Yeah. I'm glad that we get to have them again. So, Jeff, I was intrigued by your suggestion of um, history and history. of you, and I haven't read the long one yet, is that you were um, an editor at USA Today. But you're more than that. What, what do you really do there? Oh, well, I am an editor. So my, the reason I'm the Supreme Court editor is I actually went to law school right out of college. Graduated from law school in 97. Uh -huh. uh, we just had our 25th reunion this past summer. And then I practiced law for nine years. Uh -huh. uh, two clerkships in there, Central District in Los Angeles, District Court, and then the D.C. Circuit with Judith Rogers about 20 years ago. Fun. And then sort of early, mid-30s, I had like what I call an early midlife crisis, and I went back to school in 2006, got a master's in journalism, came back to Washington, had been in Washington as a young lawyer, came back to Washington as a journalist, and uh -huh. basically started all over again and started a career in journalism from scratch at CNN. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Um, and, and thought I would be a political journalist and did that and really stayed away from legal coverage and legal journalism and Supreme Court coverage. Why? Um, because I just sort of almost felt like it was cheating and I, I sort of reasoned if I wanted to just be talking about the law and talking to judges and professors I could have stayed a lawyer right and so I really I know in, in, in retrospect it makes no sense now it's just obvious that I should be we doing someone to tell us what it means in our own language yeah yeah. Yeah. Of yeah 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 so 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 just over the course of the years particularly since 2015 it's like legal coverage found me I didn't find it so I started to get asked. Um, I worked overnight at the Washington Post, and my boss used to be in that job, used to be the Supreme Court correspondent for the Post many years ago, Fred Barbash. And so he would come in, and he would have, he, I want to write about the Supreme Court case that's pending. And he ran our team. He ran the overnight blog team. And so I, it, he was the boss. It's like, who's going to edit the boss? I was the deputy editor. I used to be a lawyer, so I would edit him. And then I moved to NPR. And I moved to NPR and the Washington Desk there when the Mueller investigation started. And so I, I did all editing of all digital coverage at NPR of the Mueller investigation for two years straight from the first day of it to the day the Mueller report came out. The, the day the Mueller report came out was actually my last day there. I did that on purpose. And then I came to USA Today as a political editor. And then the gentleman, an older uh, journalist who had Supreme Court editing as part of his portfolio left. And they asked me to take on that portfolio because of my legal background. Along with the political? So I was doing, I had, that portfolio was Supreme Court and then the whole rest of it was international. 